Hello and welcome to Magic the Gathering for Advanced Players. I'm going to do some keep or mull quick hits today. Going to keep it tight. Two hands, one modern, one standard. Going to talk about, again, as we always do on Magic the Gathering for Advanced Players, not just what do we think is the right play, but why. How do we extrapolate from that? How do we learn from that? Hand number one, let's get to it. Black, white, red, sometimes called Mardu Death Shadow. Mardu a little misleading. Teamer Battle Rage being the only red card in the main. This weird looking card is a path to exile. Um, here's your deck. You've got, you're familiar with it if you're a modern player. It's Jacob Wilson's deck from the Pro Tour. Um, and it's featuring Death Shadow, Ranger, Captain of Yosa, to find it, Life Loss, Cantrip, etc. Okay. So we're on the, we're, I, I didn't receive information about whether we're on the play or the draw, um, but th th you don't know your opponent's deck. Let's take the play first. So assuming we're on the play, what do we do with this hand? Street Wraith, three silent clearings, a Sculler, a Thoughtseize, a Godless Shrine. So first of all, I want to talk about, again, the general, how am I approaching this type of hand? First of all, do I have something to do in the early turns is absolutely critical in modern. You know, your hands that look kind of okay, but they don't get started until turn three, turn four, those are generally going to be mulligans. There's just so much going on in the early turns. You just, you, you oftentimes you're hopelessly behind. Um, your opponent has put together something that's, that's snowballing out of control, or they've disrupted your strategy. Now, you know, they've been able to disrupt you, and now they're, they're moving on. You're hoping a top deck. It's just so much can go wrong when you don't have the early stuff. So I think we have early things to do, use our mana, interact. Thought Season Tide Hall of Scholar can break up whatever our opponent decided to keep, if they keep. Um, obviously, it's going to be a really powerful hand for our opponent mulligans. And then, specifically, the Death Shadow deck, you got to think about, do I have access to the card Death Shadow? Do I have ways to lose life? Because my game plan is not really in top gear if I'm not losing life, getting down to 12 or less, and then finding and playing a Death Shadow. Here you have Street Wraith, which is all, always makes mulliganing a little bit more difficult in decks that play Street Wraith, Mishra's Bobble. So you can't you can't look at this and say I know exactly. You actually don't know whether you have a Death Shadow or not, or because the Street Wraith is kind of the seventh card in your hand. It's kind of a face down card, if that makes sense. And it's important to think about that kind of effect in a deck like this, because you can see above four Mishra's Bobble, four Street Wraith. A lot of our hands don't have full transparency into what cards we're going to have this game. If we start really overcorrecting and mulliganing a lot because ignore like pretend those cards are like zeros, we're going to be mulliganing way too much. If you, if you count those so it's not a zero. Clearly street wraith is both a way to lose life and it's some mix of lands and spells and some percentage of death shadow whatever. So long story short, I think that's one way to think about it. You know, what's most important to this deck? Some early interaction, some life loss, a way to find Death Shadow. We're checking some of those boxes, but we don't have Death Shadow. There, You might find a player who says, you know what? If my hand doesn't have a Death Shadow or a way to find it, I'm going to mulligan because my deck doesn't have... I don't have, like, you know, cantrips. I don't have serum visions to find Death Shadow, so I'm just not finding enough. I, I, I mean, that... It's something to explore. I mean, it's possibly correct, but my instinct is to keep this hand. I think that you've got enough of the pieces in general between disrupting your opponent, Street Wraith, and Silent Clearings, getting you deeper to hopefully find that Death Shadow and be at 12 or fewer life when you do find it. I think there's enough going on here that I'm inclined to keep. I want to talk about a couple things, a couple tricks that I use in these contexts. One is kind of, okay, if this was a mull to six and we had to bottom one of the cards, how good would it look? So if this is a mull to six, we'd bottom one of these three silent clearings and we'd have this hand. If this, if, whenever I do that exercise in my mind, if that's a hand that would be like a really good six, like a very, very clear, really good six, then you don't want to mulligan that because then you're mulliganing and you're going to find some midpoint on average that's worse than, than what this hand is. So you, you're going to want to keep those. Plus you have an extra card. It's not worth zero. However, I look at this hand in particular, I don't think this is, this, this is like an overwhelming six. Like, oh, this is clearly a great above average six. I mean, it looks like maybe about the average six, it, roughly. I mean, so I guess it makes me lean slightly more towards keep because you do have the extra card. It matters. But so this, the, it's an exercise I almost always engage in with my close hands. But here it doesn't, it doesn't really provide the answer. But I'm still, I still want to look at that. And then lastly, just, let's just, you know, one thing I do use in my aggressive decks as kind of a tiebreaker, I'm playing an aggressive deck, 
Oftentimes, my aggressive decks in modern, in particular, have ways have lands that mitigate flood. So in Affinity, the deck that I played at the Mythic Championship London, you had like, you know, your Nexus lands, right? Your Ink Moth Nexus, your Blink Moth Nexus, cards that are kind of built to mitigate flood. The same principle shows up in, you know, the uh, Heart and Scales deck. The same principle is going to show up in a burn deck that has some of these same, you know, silent clearing type of lands that help you get deeper. I think if you have a land heavy hand with none of those, or, you know, it's just like, if this is like Godless Shrine, fetch, 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 I'd be more inclined to mulligan, much more inclined to mulligan that. So if I think it's close, I'll use which lands I have as a tiebreaker. I really like doing that in Infinity, because in Infinity, a lot of the three, four land hands are close, and I'm going to use as a tiebreaker what which lands they are. So to sum up, so you need to be able to lose life in the Death Shadow deck, really, for it to be firing on all cylinders. We have that. And in fact, you can you want to think about well, look, Thoughtseize, Street Wraith, Godless Shrine. It's actually like a way to quickly lose life, not just like eventually, but you know, this is this hand. It's not like a two silent clearing hand that it's going to take ten turns. No, we're going to get there quickly. We don't have the card Death Shadow, the, the biggest important, most important missing piece here. We want slash need early interaction. It's almost a need in modern. It's, you know, we like to describe it as a want, but if we're being honest, in modern, it's almost a need. We have that. We have card draw and dig for what we need. So again, Street Wraith cannot be rounded to zero. That draw card is very real. The silent clearings, we can start drawing cards as early as turn three. We might we might locate that Death Shadow or, or whatever that whatever other pressure we're looking for. Useful lands or mana sinks to avoid flood downside. In my land heavy hands, that's gotta be part of what I'm thinking about when I fan the hand out. Do I have a way to kind of use the extra mana? Lands that convert into another resource. Wait, a mana sink. So that, this hand has that. So I'm, I lean keep with all that on the play. On the draw, I think the analysis is mostly the same on this hand. This is not a hand that's particularly influenced by play or draw. On the draw, we, I think even we're even more likely to want a card like Thoughtseize. And we have more access to resources. Like to, We're going to have more draws, more cards to find. Our, that's, I guess it's probably a better keep on the draw because I think Thoughtseize and Sculler... Is a nice curve on the draw, but I think it's also good enough on the play. So regardless of whether on the play or the draw, I think this hand checks enough of the boxes to keep. Let's switch to standard. Here I'm playing a Golos deck. This is not a user submitted one. This is one that I just pulled up when I was practicing. I've, we've got a 28 land deck. We only have two of the lands. So here, this screenshot, I actually I kept it. This is a literal playtest game against a friend. We're, we're practicing. I decided to keep it. Um, was that a good decision or a bad decision? So we've got a blue and a green to cast the growth spiral. The ramp is really important. Um, we're playing a, a deck that, you know, just the five drops in lands, those are oftentimes your hands where you end up at the end of the game regretting, like, well, I just got run over, or my opponent did the same thing, but they had the ramp, so now they're too far ahead. So I think the ramp cards are really important to this deck, so that's what made me keep it. But is, was that smart? So with 28 lands, one thing to notice is like, okay, what am, I, what am I actually asking of my deck and how likely is that? We're studying the game after the fact. We're going to want to do some math that I didn't have. I mean, I, mean I, I know these numbers off the top of my head roughly because this is one that comes up often. You want to get to that place too where you have rough, a rough approximation of what these numbers are. Let's talk about it. So you go look up hypergeometric calculator, Google that term, hypergeometric calculator, the easiest way to figure this out. Population size 53. So we've already seen seven cards, 53 left. We've already seen two lands. So a 28 land deck, there's 26 lands left. The sample size in two. So if we're asking the question in the top two cards, how likely that one of them is land? So basically how likely is it that we will get to growth spiral a land and a play on turn two? The answer to that question is it's about 75%. The bottom one, greater than or equal to one. So there's either one or two cards in the top two, about 75% of the time. That's pretty good. Um, you know, that does give us a 25% pretty much fail rate. Because if on turn two we're going growth spiral, no land, go, our hand is in pretty rough shape. I mean, I guess third, third land, beanstalk giant, fourth land. I mean, I guess we're not dead, but... It's definitely not great. So there's a failure rate popping up. But I think for this hand to actually be good, we, we're, we want to think about those turn four, or sorry, those turn three, either Wrath or Golos hands. So that would require two lands in our top three. And so if we change the sample size to three and the number of successes to two, that's going to show up for us 
only about 48.5% of the time. And when it doesn't, we're, our hand is pretty pedestrian. We're on the play, and it's just, you know, we may miss a land drop and then play Beanstalk Giant. So this becomes pretty close because, you know, 48% of the time, we actually have a, a, some real upside. But in a deck like this, it's actually so valuable you making your land drops. The deck mulligans really well because it has so much redundancy and, um, you know, the X, you just have extras of these five drops that are easy to bottom and, and you know, you're still you're still going. I think on balance is a close hand. It's a good one to think through and use to illustrate the math. I think ultimately this is probably a mulligan. I think that it's just the failure rate's a little bit too high. That you know, twenty five percent that we never really come out of the gate, and then, you know, over fifty percent that we don't get the don't we don't realize the explosiveness. And there's certainly obviously there's no guarantee we're gonna win those games. We have, we're not impacting the board for the first few turns, you know, for the not in, not in turn two, not in turn three. Are we influencing the board even in the upside scenario? So we're not going to be 100% to win in, in this 48% or that 75%. So I think on balance, I think a six-card hand probably does better on the play, but it's close. So I'm curious to, you know, if you've, got, if you've played this deck a lot, you have an opinion, I'd love to hear it. But for me, this, is pro this probably should be a mulligan, even though my first instinct here you can see was to keep because the ramp spells are important. Looking at the math and thinking about it a little bit more, I think it's probably a mulligan. So those are the two hands we're doing today. Send me more examples. I want, I want to hear about your tough mull or keep decisions. Screenshot it. Send me a screenshot of the deck. Send me a screenshot of the hand. Let's talk about those. Tough gameplay decisions. You know, you want to hear me analyze it, send it in. You know, maybe I'll pick it. In my next round, something to talk about, game state, keeper mall, whatever. At Sick of It is where you can find me. Just my DMs are open. Shoot those screenshots over. And subscribe to the channel if you like this type of content. Hit the alert button. You'll get an alert when I post a new video. Appreciate the support. Thank you.